alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Step Up, the show by young Muslim women for young Muslim women. I'm Sara. And I'm Khadija. We have such an exciting series so far and we may be coming to the end now. I know, but we still have three episodes to go, including this one, so lots to keep you busy and entertained in the meantime. So speaking of being busy, what's on the show today? We start off with Ask Big Sister, where we discuss the youth under Allah's shade. Big Sister Zara will be answering our questions about a day in which there will be no shade except his. We then speak to Summer Huck about activism and her work with the online newspaper, The Typewriter. We then learn more about the remarkable Sahabia, Nusayba bin Ka'ab, radiyallahu anha, and how we can learn from her example today. Then finally, we speak to Shinaz, who is a teacher, author, and illustrator. And lastly, but by no means least, we have our weekly competition for you all to give away some amazing prizes, so make sure you enter that. So Matt is coming up in the next hour, so don't go anywhere. Today on Ask Big Sister, we are discussing the youth under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shade. Joining me today, I have with me Sister Anisha. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. I also have with me Sister Sara. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. And I also have with me Sister Artika. Wa alaikum. So, sisters, welcome to the show. Um, so, inshallah, today we're going to be talking about the youth under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shade. Mm -hmm. And before we begin the discussion, I'd like to ask you what are you most dedicated to? Good oh, question. That's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose since I've just finished my essays, most of my life has just been studying and revising for exams. <laughs> so I think I'm going to have to say my education. I am quite have been quite dedicated to yeah. Yeah, I should education. be dedicated <laughs> to my education. Yeah. But one thing that I'm really passionate about, one thing that I love doing is community work and working with other young people. So I'm really, really dedicated to finding new ways to you know help and engage other young people. So as youth, we are all dedicated to something in our lives. But mm -hmm. it's important to remember that these things that we are dedicated to, we can use them as forms of worship towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's actually a hadith where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, there are seven whom Allah will shade in his shade on the day of judgment, when there is no shade except his. He then went on to mention seven categories of people, the second which was the youth who grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what does this mean for us in the 21st century and how can we make sure that we're making the most of our lives in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? With so many distractions around us, how can we focus on our deen? To help us answer these questions, we have with us Sister Zahra, who's on the Ask Big Sister hot seat today. Please join us, Big Sister. Welcome, everyone. Are you again? Nice Hello. Hello. Welcome Hello. back, sister. Exactly, for me again. <laughs> so, will you please introduce yourself, please? Right now, I'm, I'm looking to go to university in September. I'm really looking forward to that, um, to study oh. chemistry, inshallah. Mm -hmm. I heard you guys talking about what you want to do in the future. Inshallah, I'm interested in drug design. So, you know, I think right now, nowadays, we develop drugs because of profit rather than the benefit of the drug mm -hmm. itself. So, inshallah, that's something I'm looking to pursue. Mm. That's really cool. Have you already like delved into you know the study of like drugs and very briefly? I mean, you got all those diagrams <laughs> that scare yeah. you off, but I like the theory of it. So inshallah, that's something I want to pursue. Inshallah, I'll yeah. make it easy for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, sister Zahra, on today's show, we're talking about you know the beautiful hadith where the Prophet said and mentioned seven categories of people who are going to be under the shade of Allah on the day where there's no shade. Um, and one of those types of people are young people, young people who grew up worshiping Allah, making the focus of their lives worshiping Allah. So. Of course, in, in Islam, the definition of youth is a bit different to how we typically define it. So could you kind of expand on that? What does young people, what does the youth mean in Islamic terms? In Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, it's defined for us that youth is up until the age of 40. Wow. Now, that's quite amazing. So I'm not looking at that kind of thing. Oh my God, no, you're a teenager when you're 18. You can get a driving license. Youth. But no, in Islam, it's up until the age of 40. So we have so much time mm. from now, from when we're young to up till 40 to, you know, make use of our time because after that, you won't have much time. You know, one of, again, like we were saying, you know, value five things before five others. One of them is time before you're preoccupied. So in your youth, you should, you have so much time. It's amazing, subhanAllah, 40 years you know okay obviously when you're a kid you can't <laughs> but, it's but it does so much time. go quickly so yeah, it I does. Mean, like yeah. we say it is a lot of time but we need to utilize the time we have now I mean even when you when you hit school you look back on when you're in year seven yeah. and it was like yeah. wow that was like five years ago I'm five years older already <laughs> Definitely. so yeah. the mindset that the youth have compared to what the youth 
in Islam should have is completely yeah. different as well. Yeah. Like you mentioned the YOLO culture and that's just like, well, in Islam, if you're youth up until 40, there's no such thing as a YOLO exactly. culture. There's no period in time where yeah. you should be thinking, that, oh, well, I'm young, I don't need to be doing this and that. No. Yeah, um, if we yeah. look at it this way, that, you know, you have 40 years to be able to be Become part of this hadith, yeah. like to be yeah. someone who can earn Allah's shade. It's a lot of time. Yeah. Become so the it's best just, you can be. Exactly. Yeah. And to be, so you have like multiple, you have 40 years of chances. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's really interesting when you look at it that way. And yeah. I think as youth, we don't value that hadith, but, 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 but you know, if you think about on the Day of Judgment and you read about the Day of Judgment and how it's going to be, where the yeah. sun's going to be so close that you're going to be dripping in sweat and some people will be up to their knees and some people will be up to from all the, you know, the heat. Um, and I remember when I first heard this hadith, I was, um, I was really young, I was like 12 or 13. And I remember the sister who was giving the talk, she started crying when she gave the hadith because mm -hmm. she was like, I'm not one of them. And um, she was saying, you know, you've got so many years to be a part of that and to be relieved from that heat on the day of judgment, oh make gosh. the most of it. So in other places in Islam and other places in the Quran and in the hadith of the Prophet there's a big emphasis, emphasis on young people. Um, why is this? If you think about in general, the youth, it's not just Muslims that have on Islam that has placed so much importance on the youth. Even non-Muslims, if you ask them, you know, the youth in general in society have have a lot of importance placed on them. You know, education and you know, developing the youth and making them into young citizens of the society. Um, so, you know, even in Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu you know, when he when it, revelation first came to him, um, the bunch of the Sahabas that you know first came to Islam were of the ages of around 10 to 17. You had mm -hmm. Ali Lahun, who was only 10 years old when he came to the Deen. You had the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Asma, who was 17. You had Saad ibn Abi Waqas, who was 17 as well. And that's the t natural trend that happened at the time. You know, the youth were the most interested in the Deen and they were open to different ideas. And if we think about in general, why is it that the youth are so important? It's because think about yourselves. You know, you're you're just starting out in life. You've got different ideas. You've got creative ideas, ideas that adults may not have come up, you know, thought of. Um, so we bring fresh ideas to the table, you know, we have more energy, or well, most of the youth I know have energy. Um, so we bring that to the table and that's something, you know, you can't replace. Um, so it's really important. Uh, I like what you said about how young people are more open to change yeah. and how they made up the yeah. bulk of the Muslims who initially accepted Islam. So I feel like that's that's really important. Like, you know, when with all the various negative things that we see okay. in our communities, I feel like, you know, us as young people are the most eligible to, to bring about change. Yeah. Another reason is, you know, the youth in general, we're all very vulnerable, you know, like you Definitely. said, we're open to change, but we don't know a lot about the world, we're trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, look at today's society, you know, the youth going, you know, in the wrong direction is so evident. You have the whole YOLO attitude, you know, you only have lived once, um, you know, you want to enjoy yourself and it's propagated in every sphere of society, you know, even just on a Coke can, you know, live it up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's everywhere that, you know, the youth are being convinced into living according to the life that society propagates, which is to enjoy yourself to the full. Whereas in Islam, in, in Islam, this is not the case, you know. Mm -hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, you have to value five things before five mm -hmm. others. And one of those was your youth before your old age and your time before you are preoccupied. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even when you're young, you have so much time. You have studies, but, you know, like parents and mothers, they have to fend for their children. They have to go out mm -hmm. to work. We don't have those responsibilities yeah. as of yet. So it's really important when you're young to value your time, which is not something that, that is propagated in the society. It's yeah, more, you know, really. do whatever you want to do when you're young while you can, not yeah. do yeah. something of substance, which is what Islam says. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, the zeal and the energy exactly. is all there, yeah. right? But it's just about channeling it in the right way. Exactly. Definitely. I feel the youth of today, they just want to grow up so yeah. fast. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I think it's more about living in, well, in a sense, living in the moment and developing yourself, you know, at yeah. the time. And yeah. developing yeah. your iman and your deen, that's what we're supposed to be doing yeah. at this age. So you don't want to rush to grow up where yeah, you have no time. Yeah. You want to spend the time here, you know, reading the Quran, memorizing it, you know, because you're not going to have time later. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really important. But like, what does it mean to worship Allah in this hadith? Like, is it just praying and fasting? You know, if we said if it, we said that worship in general was just praying and fasting, you're cutting off a big aspect of your deen, of your life, you know? Yeah. Praying and fasting would make up, what, 1% of your time during mm -hmm. the day? Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many more aspects in your, in your daily life that can be worship. It's about intention and it's about, you know, how you view it. So, you know, if, if for example, student A or let's say me, you know, I go to university because I want to make money and I want to enjoy myself. I'm not saying that's the case. <laughs> but I mean, in general, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> so,
So let's say I want to go to university and I want to earn money and I want to enjoy myself, I want to travel the world and do all of these sorts of things. But student B is, for example, going to university to study so that they can become more learned in the deen and in society and in life so that they can give it to their kids. Or, you know, if a man's going to, you know, university or school, even a woman, they're going so that they can one day fend for their families, mm -hmm. you know. There's an intention in that which is rewardable, whereas the, one, the person, that, student A, who's going to university, there is no intention. They tend to just enjoy themselves as for themselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, worship is not just um, praying and fasting. It's how you view your life and it's your intention behind every action that you do. Um, worship can be from you obeying your parents, you going to school because you're obeying your parents in that way. Um, you know, like, you, like I said, you going to university to get an education. All of this can be part of worship. Yeah. yeah, I like what you said about how, you know, praying and fasting really doesn't make up much yeah. of our time. And I think a lot of young people kind of, you know, they, they don't practice Islam because they believe the opposite. Yeah. That, you know, ugh, five times a day, yeah. five times a day. <laughs> like, it's yeah. just that kind of attitude, but it's, it's true. Like, you know, Islam is much more than that. Exactly. It's not the be all and end all um, to Islam to pray yeah. and to fast. So it's a really, really interesting yeah. point. It's, it's very difficult in the society to view worship in that way because think about Christians and Hindus and things like that. Their religion in itself is all these little acts. You know, mm. they go to the church on Sundays. But Islam is not like that. Islam came as a way of life. And we say that a lot, but we do we actually understand what it, you know, what it means mm. um, to, for it to be a way of life. It's not just going to the mosque on a Friday, is it? It's your etiquette. It's how you rule in society, how you act with one another. It's yeah. everything, isn't it? But you know what you were saying about a lot of um, youth perceiving um, our religion to be a chore or, you, yeah. know, you know, five times a day to be like so much. I think it kind of ties into the idea that it, it, we shouldn't see it as a chore yeah. and that in a sense the Quran and the Sunnah is supposed to be the basis for our lives. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be something we use to empower ourselves. It's supposed to be a part of our everyday lives. You know, you can make it, like we said earlier, part of anything that you're dedicated yeah. to. Yeah. You know, if I'm sitting down to revise for my exam, you know, if I renew my intention at the beginning, that becomes an act of worship. Definitely. It's the basis for every aspect. Yeah. So I suppose, um, how can we, in a sense, develop our attachment to the Quran in order, you know, for it to be a basis yeah. um, for our lives, because that is how we will be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Inshallah. If we've lived our lives by the Quran yeah. and Sunnah. So I mean, practically, you know, there's there's so many ways we can draw our closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will in turn help us, you know, view worship in this way and see it as, a, you know, increase our attachment to the Quran and Sunnah and things that can be the hajjud, you know, waking up at least maybe to Ad for every other day or once a week to pray, you know, at night when no one's watching, you know, you're building your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that connection, then it becomes very difficult for that attachment to the deen to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you're not encouraged in the society to do that. So it might take you a hundred alarm clocks in your room to wake up. <laughs> But just doing that and doing, you know, doing it for the sake of Allah and not to please anyone, that will build your connection with the deen. And um, one of the scholars, Hassan al-Basri, once said, um, indeed, those who came before you saw the Quran as personal words from their rub, so they would ponder over it by night and yearn for it by day. Yeah. So they saw the Quran as not something alien, not something that, you know, it's, it's there or you look at it when you want to or when you've got free time. Yeah. They saw it as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking to them directly so that it would affect their lives and, you know, it would make them think. And that's how we need to view the Quran and the Sunnah to build our attachment to the deen. It's actually a really beautiful quote that comes to my mind. I don't remember it word for word, but it was so lovely. It was like saying that, you know, when you get a letter from someone that you love, yeah, yeah. you read over it multiple times. Yeah. So the Quran is there always yeah. because it's a letter from Allah who loves us. And, you know, and, and for us to read over it again and again, it's developing that connection mm -hmm. with someone that we also love. You can only develop that love if you understand it. So mm -hmm. it's about reading the meaning of the Quran exactly. as well. And if you even just read the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha during your salah, you know that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is actually having a conversation yeah. with you. Yeah. So you build that love for your salah because you know that wait, I have a problem. Let me just go pray my salah, and I can actually talk to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and yeah. talk to him about my problem. I think that's really cool, and I yeah. think it's also you know when you read the Quran, when you sit down to kind of renew your intention and just like believe in your heart that this message whatever i'm about to read is for me yeah. like forget everybody else you know all of mankind allah has chosen me to be sitting here at this moment to be reading it. and i think that's a very i suppose a starting point to develop that kind of relationship yeah, you know, with the word of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so as youth we're usually influenced by you know society and social media and it can have quite a negative impact and how can we stop this um impact from influencing us yeah, there's no, I mean, that's a really good question because there's no denying the influence that society has on our lives. You know, you go, go to the shops, you know, they're trying to, you know, magazines, TV programs, they're trying to shout it down our throats that this is how we want you to live your life. But in Islam, you know, we have a completely different way that we view our life. 
And you know, one of the ways which you know the Prophet ﷺ really emphasized when he was when, during his, in the Sira, we see it, is having good company. Mm. And you know, as youth, our friends are a big part of our lives. And you know, it's it's such a small thing, but having good friends does really rub off on you. Mm. And you know, um, Umar bin Khattab once, uh, Radi Lahan, once said, um, do, "Do not befriend the corrupt because they will the corruption will become part of you as well." Um, and you know, in one hadith, the Prophet says, "The likelihood, the likeliness of a righteous friend and an evil friend is the likeliness of musk perfume seller and yeah. a blacksmith." You know that yeah. famous um, hadith yeah. where you know the blacksmith, even if you don't go in there to mix with the person, they will rub off on you. The smell will rub off on you, and so will the the sweet smelling perfume. So you know, when you're young, I remember when I was a lot younger, um, friends. You know, you go out with your friends. You're always with them. You're not actually with your parents a lot of the time when you're in education or you know when you're in. When when you're studying so it's really important to have good company especially in the society where you have so many distractions and you have so many things that are trying to tell you otherwise yeah I think there's another side to the conversation as well like yeah. you know for a lot of people I know I was put in this position at some point where it's really difficult to find good friends it's really difficult to find people who are like-minded people who who you know they they they're not doing what everyone else is doing mm. and they, they they choose to live a more you know dignified life and they choose to you know do better things and and aim to aspire to do better things but um, in that case I found that you know just working on being a good friend and yeah. working yeah. on being a positive yeah. and a good influence to people around you I think that really helps overcome that it's really good because yeah. I know so many people are in that situation where there, there are no like-minded people yeah. and then you kind of get into the mode where it's like okay well what, what do I do then I'm just gonna yeah. I might as well just go along with everyone else like what else can I do yeah. but I think that's a really good attitude to have because it's it a really works good solution both ways, you know yeah. your friend can rub off on you but you can rub off on your friend as well yeah. so be that person that your friend will want to be like or you know even just in little things like how you behave your friends might notice it and they might want to change mm. as a result of it you know yeah, people respect other people with values. Yeah, that yeah. sticks to their values, yeah, you know. Definitely. You may think that you're doing something strange by wearing hijab, for instance. People may look at you, but if you stick to your value and you explain why you're doing it, people will respect you for definitely. having ideas and having yeah. not just, you know, they being like everyone themselves. else. Yeah. They do, even if you don't think they do. They do. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, I mean, society does have that kind of perception that, you know, when you are doing something like wearing hijab, you do stick out and, and they're made, you're made to believe it's a negative thing. But there's, um, you know, another perception that society has, which leads me on to my next question, and that's, um, you know, that there's, you constantly have to impress other people, you know, yeah. or especially on the outside. You constantly yeah. have to look good, yeah. constantly have to, you know, say good things yeah. or, you know, just make sure that everyone mm. is pleased with you in the room. Mm. Um, and sometimes that can, you know, that can enter the realm of worship which becomes very dangerous, of course. So what, what advice would you give for young people who are trying to, trying to you know, um, embark on the journey of worship and making Allah a focus? But you know, it's very difficult to keep our sincerity in check. Yeah, it's always important, obviously, to remember your intention behind doing everything that you do. Mm -hmm. um, today, you know, you have the youth, you have them on Twitter, you have them on Facebook, you have them on Instagram, you have them on Snapchat, you have all these mediums for, where, where people are just showing other people their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to get caught up in that and want to be like other people and want to impress other people. And I think one way that you can humble yourself, because, you know, in Islam, you have to humble yourself, you know, um, is to not publicize it as much you know that's one way you can humble yourself you know I have people on my on my on, who I know in my in my groups and, and stuff and they take pictures of themselves when they're praying to hundreds and stuff and that should be between you and your creator it shouldn't be so that you know you're telling someone else or you're trying to impress someone else it should be between you and your creator and again you know we're talking about the connection that's what builds that connection and that attachment to the deen Definitely. Again, another thing that's personally helped me is that, you know, for us sitting here, we are in the public eye. Yeah. <laughs> and one thing that my teacher also um, recommended is that for every public deed you do, or for everything that you do that where people can see, you make sure there's like three other private things yeah. that you yeah. do. Yeah. And if it's difficult for you to keep track, actually write a list. Yeah. Make yeah. it a practical uh, part of your life mm -hmm. that, okay, I was on Islam Channel today, so tonight I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And I think that's just, it really helps when you mm -hmm. try and find a balance within your own life. That's a really good way, yeah. People do forget that it can be something you do in private. Like, you can sit in your bedroom when no one is watching and just open the Quran and read one verse, yeah. you know, one yeah. verse. Like, you forget you can do things when nobody's watching. So it's a good reminder. Yeah. I think as a youth, we need to, like, make a difference in society today. Yeah. And, like, do you have any examples of, like, youth who have made a difference in the past as well as today? Yeah. Our history and history in general of the world is filled with examples of youth who have mm -hmm. instigated or who have either started a movement to bring about change and yeah. has resulted in change. I mean, from our history in itself, we had, you know, um, Muhammad bin Fatih, who conquered Constantinople, and he was of such a young age. Um, we had Aisha who narrated the most number of, you know, hadiths, and mm. she was how old when she when she did that. 
Um, even in recent history, you had the Arab Spring, which was started by a youth who was frustrated that he wasn't getting paid. And Mohammed bin uh, Bouazi, I think, yeah, his name was. And he started the whole of the Arab Spring. He didn't start it as in the main reason, but he instigated it. And it shows, you know, look what's happening in the Arab Spring now. People are overthrowing, you know, tyrant rulers. And it can go a long way. And even, I don't know if you guys know any of any other examples of the youth in our history or even nowadays that, you know, have started something. Yeah, and like you mentioned, some really great uh, Sahaba and Sahabiyat, and yeah. um, you know, I, I think it's very easy for us to forget that a lot of the religion, um, when it initially came, its foundation was made by teenagers, yeah, exactly. and that's a big yeah. deal. And I think you know, the point that I wanted to bring in is about how there is this sentiment or there is this kind of attitude that you're too young to do this. I mean, yeah. I've heard that countless yeah. times yeah. that you're too young to do this. You know, wait a little bit till you're older. But no, that shouldn't be the case. Me and my mom were actually having this conversation the other day. It's like you're young. So make the most of it. Yeah. And I think that's the attitude that if a lot of young people start to develop, they will be change. There will be positive change. We will make an impact in society. Yeah, that just reminds me of things that really frustrate me. Like even in certain cultures, you know, you go to the mosque and for instance, there may be like a young boy who wants to stand in the front row and pray and the elders would be like, no, you know, go, go to the back, go stand at the back. And it's like, you know, we need to value I have experience being physically pulled <laughs> to the back. Yeah. It's, like, but, it's about motivating them to do better, even if it's just letting them stand at the front, because they're going to be like, oh my God, subhanAllah, they're letting me do this. And mm. he's going to be like, you know what, I'm going to run to Salah the next time so I can exactly. go to the front as well. Yeah. It's about motivating, and such a young age, you would want that to happen. Yeah. And it's important because we really want them to be inspired. You know, this young boy, he would run to the next Salah and be like, you know what, I really, really want to pray. And that's the sort of motivation that we should that's be giving aim. out. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And I think leading on from that idea of inspiration and learning from examples in Islamic legacy, whether they be, you know, um, Zayd, the Prophet's um, adopted son who was so young mm -hmm. when he accepted Islam. Um, I think having pride and confidence in the legacy of Islam that we have been gifted with, um, I think that we need to give advice or yeah. perhaps address the idea of trends and negative trends because that is so relevant to all youth, yeah. you know, via access, um, via to, from social media, yeah. you know, etc. How how can they deal with negative trends? How do they either reject them or deal with them? You know, how do they deal with negative trends? It might sound really simple, but sometimes the, what the youth nowadays don't do is think, they just act. Yeah. So, you know, with certain trends that come up or, you know, think trending hashtags on Twitter, people just participate yeah, without thinking think. about the connotations behind them or what they're actually supporting. Yeah. Um, and you have leaders, even young leaders that come about in the news and in the media, mm. um, and we all support them, you know, but we don't actually think about what they're supporting or what their message actually is. And I think when you're trying to sift out the good trends and the bad trends mm. within the Muslim community and even the general community, you need to start thinking and referencing it back to Islam. Yeah. Um, someone can't give you that ability to think, you have to do it yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to every single one of us. Um, and you know, when you're thinking, you have to think in terms of Islam, not in terms of, is this going to look cool? Is yeah. this good? Is mm. this not going to look good? Um, and it goes back to trying to make an impression, you know, the youth were very young, you know, youth in general want to stand out, they mm. want to, you know, be different. Um, but as, if it's different for the sake of Allah, that's really yeah, good. But if it's yeah. different for the sake of the dunya, then it's not, it's not good. Yeah, and like leading off from that, you know, if it is um, different for the sake of Allah, yeah. which could be a positive response. So yeah. you could actively be involved in these trends or whatever, yeah. and to do do so in a positive way, to do a positive exactly. spin on it. So you can like use social media for the good. You yeah. know, there's so many groups on Facebook that are pages on Facebook that are amazing, you yeah. know. Um, they, they bring about the revolution to the page, you know, in the Muslim world, and they bring about the struggles of Muslims in the Muslim world so that people can make dua for them, so people can see what's happening in the Ummah. You know, the Prophet said, you so know, the nice one nice. who doesn't wake up in the morning and think about the Ummah or go to sleep at night and doesn't think of the Ummah is not one of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the Facebook and social media has, the Facebook, yeah. social media in general has helped us in certain ways, and we should take the good things from it, not the bad so things. So I think it's about yeah. just remembering that everything that you do should be for the sake of Allah, yeah. and if you ask yourself that question will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be happy if I do this or if I mm. tweet this or if I follow this yeah. if the answer to that is no then you know that you shouldn't be doing it okay. Jazakallah khairan for that discussion sisters Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam honored the youth by mentioning them in this hadith and through this showed the enormous potential that we have as young people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that we do and that will benefit us in this life and the akhirah inshallah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us part of those under his shade. Ameen. Mm -hmm. And we're off to a break now, but do tweet us to let us know your thoughts in our discussion. That's at Islam channel, hashtag step up. See you in three. Assalamu alaikum.
On this week's standout segment, I meet Samar Haq to discuss her views on activism and her role as editor for the online newspaper, Typewriter. Activism conjures up different meanings to many people. So what actually is activism? I think activism has a very, uh, in this day and age, it has very negative connotations. You tell someone that they're an activist and you think, you automatically think it's something very dangerous, they're going out rioting and so on and so forth. Um, activism isn't, to me, it isn't that at all. And I think it's very important to make that distinction, that it isn't negative. It isn't associated with negativity at all. It's almost a different way of saying contributing to society. That's how I see it and that's how I've always seen it. What I do is I am an activist in my own home. So I do things for the betterment of society by writing, by editing, about current affairs, about uh, relevant affairs that contribute to the wider public, that contribute to all of us. So that would be my definition of activism. So how and why did you decide to become an activist? There were a lot of issues, and as a lot of us know, in the world that definitely need um, sort of rethinking. There's a lot of issues that need to be dealt with in very, in very appropriate and suitable manners. Um, we all know that there are a lot of situations where people have gone out and they've said the wrong thing, although they meant something else. And there's a lot of that misunderstanding culture that's been rising in, in today's society. So I think to, to have somebody who can convey the correct message and to convey it in a very appropriate and suitable way, given today's circumstance, given today's context, is extremely, extremely important. And I think to be able to convey that in a very efficient and effective manner is what we definitely, definitely need. And I think that's one of the main reasons I came into being an activist or an active contributor to society, so that we can work together in eradicating the common misconceptions of things, especially like Islam, especially like religious affairs, especially like current affairs as well, what's happening in the Middle East currently. Just having somebody with a fresh perspective or, you know, to have to have fresh minds thinking alike and working towards a similar goal. Do you feel that your passion for activism has influenced your role as an editor? Absolutely. I think my passions were definitely in line with what I wanted to write about. I've had good opinions, I've had strong opinions at times as well and I've always wanted to kind of project them on a very healthy medium, on a medium which would be highly respected and looked upon. Um, so I came across the typewriter. So can you tell us a little bit more about the typewriter, the role it plays and what you hope to achieve with it? So the typewriter was established in May 2013 and I joined in August 2013. Um, so I came in as an editor and a writer. Uh, we've just recently set up our London office of which I'm managing editor for that and our official office is in Hong Kong. Uh, we have, we're spread all across the globe, we have about 80 countries with 80, 80 plus staffers um, and we're definitely looking towards a very, very bright future hopefully. And we definitely we promote citizen journalism and talking from the local perspective. So what that means is, is we, we want to hear stories, local stories. We want to have your input, we want to have everyone's input so that everyone has an equal chance of being heard. You could say that we are the voice for the voiceless um, and we approach situations in a very unbiased manner. So we are not pro something or against something, we're very, very open and very open to all sorts of beliefs, criticisms, etc, so on and so forth. So this was the reason why we, why I joined the typewriter and why I'm sure my editor-in-chief also set it up, was so that we were able to connect like-minded people onto a similar platform because we all have one mission, to change mindsets, to, you know, to eradicate misconceptions, to promote local perspectives to give you a voice so that you can speak absolutely, anyone can join us. And it does, you can remain anonymous or you can you know, have a very high profile as well. But the point is, is that we all come together and we try and work towards a common goal, which is to promote speech, to promote opinions, to enable young people between the ages of 18 and 30 to write for us and to be able to shine different perspectives and different lights on different situations. How can young people engage in activism while still staying safe? 
I think the best way to start is from your localities. Start from home. I know a lot of young people who are like, well, I want to do this and I want to do that and I'm outraged about this and I want to make a difference. And yes, that's absolutely fine. I'm sure we all want to do that. We all want to change the world one day. And that's absolutely, I think that's totally possible. But what I do suggest for young people is start from home, start small, look online, right? Look at different websites, start with a typewriter if you wish. There are so many opportunities where you can sit at home and make such a huge difference. Pick one or two things that you really, really hold dear to you, that you really take a passion in and a strong interest in. And honestly, from there, do a quick Google search, right? Say sexual violence is something that you hold very, very dear to and you think that's a very, very important topic to be talking about. Google it, right? Campaigns for sexual violence. There will be so many searches, there will be a number, a number of opportunities for you just on something like Google. And click on one, see what it is, see what's involved, see what's happening, see what they do. A number of options will come your way. It's as simple as a Google search. A lot of people may disagree, a lot of people may get involved with activism through university societies like I said. Um, if you want to go into something maybe like charities or uh, Islamic awareness uh, um, ideas or themes, then you can go to your local mosque perhaps. Don't go onto, for example, the UN website and see what campaigns they're running, right? That's great, read up on them. But chances of you getting involved in a UN campaign as opposed to you getting involved in a campaign held by your students' union, you can already see what the chances are. Local perspectives, staying at home, doing what's in your capacity, do that and slowly you'll find yourself moving forward and moving higher into your, into your activism and into your experience. And more people, the more involved you are, the more people will be willing to take you. And if you are a great campaigner, if you, you, know, if you contribute very well and actively into society, being very efficient, being very effective, people will come to you as opposed to you running to people. Moving on to our next segment, we have an inspirational female companion who stood out amongst her peers. Let's find out who we have this week. Once a woman came to the Prophet وسلم, and she said to him, look, I feel like the Quran only addresses men, she told him. It makes the religion seem male dominated. What about us women? What share do we have? This sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Her name was Nusayba bint Ka'ab, also known as Umm Umara. She felt that women were being underrepresented within the community, so she openly spoke out. She went straight to the Prophet وسلم, who was the leader of the people, seeking change, or more so in this case, seeking clarification. Another thing to note about this encounter is how accessible the Prophet وسلم, was to Nusayba. Anyone who silences a woman, limits her opportunities, or treats her any less favorably than they would a man, is directly opposing the tradition or the sunnah of the Prophet This is further proven by what happens next in the story. The Prophet reply was preceded by divine intervention. An actual verse of the Quran was revealed to respond directly to Nusayba And this was the 35th verse from Surat Al-Ahzab, Another spectacular event to mention about the great Sahabiya Nusayba anha, was during the Battle of Uhud, where the Muslims went from having the upper hand to bewildering chaos. During the time when, based on observation, victory seemed to be on the side of the Muslims, Umar Umara went eagerly to the Prophet وسلم, to see how he was, until suddenly the tables had turned. Umar Umara didn't flee, she didn't hide. She immediately grabbed his sword and instinctively went to protect the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said after this that he didn't look left nor right amidst the confusion except that he saw Nusayba fighting bravely to defend the Muslims at a time where many fled. A necessary characteristic of a leader is to have firm feet in a time of severe wind. Nusayba had that. These are the women of Islam and it's great that we speak of their legacy but they're counting on us to continue it. Nusayba bin Takab, I really, really do love this Sahabi. She was so brave and it's so cool how she single-handedly shielded the Prophet وسلم, in the Battle of Uhud. Cool indeed. How inspirational, mashallah. Assalamu alaikum, you're watching Step Up. We meet some up-and-coming Muslim talents. <laughs> So 
Assalamu alaikum, my name is Shanaz and I am a computer science teacher at a secondary school and alongside teaching I create new products and I have just launched my new book called Mother Mariam. After I left university I had no idea where I can go and how I can make sure I keep my work halal. So I ended up teaching in um, a primary school but then that went on for three years of just trying to decide how to incorporate my creative skills. And I was losing touch to my skills. My skills in animation, my skills in um, Photoshop, creating new things, drawing, I was losing it all. And I really wanted, wanted to grasp that back. So then I thought being a computer science teacher will help me stay on top of the game. I always know the new things. So yeah, I decided to be a computer science teacher and now I, it inspired me looking at the youth today, Alhamdulillah, why am I not pursuing what I was dreaming of when I was a teenager? So I thought, okay, I can still get on with my teaching career, but I should also take my book somewhere. So I decided to take it to Amazon and Alhamdulillah, it's finally published and it is ready for distribution. <laughs> I've got my friends, my family, all my loved ones. They've always been there for me and told me, just go for it. And they've always said, Shanaz, just keep going. There were times when I've just given up. Um, there was also a time when, in my final year of university where I was hospitalised and, you know, I thought, am I going to be able to finish this? And everyone in my family, everyone I know, they kept saying to me, Shana, just keep going, you can do this. Every time an obstacle comes my way, I always push forward and reject any obstacle. So, yes, I've had many obstacles, but I have never let it stop me pursuing my book. For those who say Muslim women must be limited, and they are limited, unfortunately in the society that we live in today, in the time we're in now, Muslim women are given the most horrid portrayal of how they are restricted by the hijab, by what they wear, what they do, but that is not the case and I can protest against that. If you are at home, you're not restrained, you are a mother. You are a daughter and you are still doing things to please your Lord. You're still doing things. So that is a high rank in itself. I'm not degrading those who do that. But for the sisters who want to pursue a career, I'm telling you, put your foot outside. Take your lead and walk forward. Keep walking forward. Don't hold yourself back. It took me a very long road to get to where I am today. For you girls out there, I want you to know, never limit yourself, always keep it halal, and always try and please your Lord. In the future, I'm hoping that I will be able to launch some more books on the pious women of Islam. I want to continue being a computer science teacher, educate our students to do this themselves, pick themselves up. For those teenagers who are looking to see where they can go, you are not limited to one thing. There are so many things that you can do. Um, if you want to take up your creations in terms of creativity, you want to sell your work, go ahead and do it. Don't be ashamed. Go and st set up a stall, because that's what I did. I sold my work on a stall. It didn't work out, <laughs> but things don't always work out, you know. You just pick yourself up and you continue and you try again. So that's my advice for you girls now. No matter what career you want to go into, as long as it's halal, then take it up. See where you can go. Have contacts, look around and see who's around you and speak to your teachers, respect your teachers. Not just saying that because I am a teacher, but as a student, 
I managed to get to where I am today because I respected my teachers. Well, that's it for this episode. To give you a taste of what's coming up next week, we will be discussing friendship with our big sister Hassana. Do your friends remind you of Allah or do you struggle to find good company? We also learn more about our Sahaba. Catch us again, same time, same place next week and make sure you tweet us and let us know what you think of the show at Islam Channel, hashtag step up. Or you can email us on stepup at islamchannel.tv. Until next week, take care and keep the ummah in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum. Another inspirational Sahabi and speak to a lawyer who's also a writer. Pretty that cool. it is cool. <laughs> that and much more. Do you feel that your passion? Oh my god, I don't get it right. Back in three. Oh my god. Right. Oh. <laughs>